Welcome back to another episode of Dugout Talk. Now, today's going to be a little weird. Um, so today, I do not have Steven with me. He's okay. Um, he has a, a friend who's not feeling well. So he's taken today to uh, make sure everything's going well there. So you got me again today. Uh, this is actually the first time I've done a solo uh, Dugout Talk episode since the Braves episode. I didn't have a camera then. I do have a camera now. So it's going to be uh, you guys and me uh, the whole way through this. So today, uh, today's a very special episode. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about the dark history of Chavez Ravine uh, out there in Los Angeles. Uh, so today is Friday, March 12th. This is episode 38. And let's just jump right into it. So my history talk occurred today in 1903, which would already be 118 years ago at this point. So essentially after the club uh, ceases operations in the Charm City, Frank Farrell and Bill Devery purchased the original American League team in Baltimore, receiving approval from 15 of 16 major league owners to move the team to New York City uh, to play as the Highlanders. Uh, Giants owner John T. Brush, that would be New York Giants owner John T. Brush, uh, cast the dissenting vote, believing that the new club known as the Yankees starting in 1913. So about a decade after they moved, uh, they would compete for fans in the Big Apple. So as you can see here on the right side of our screen, uh, that is the 1903, I believe the 1902 um, Baltimore Orioles, may even be 1899. I can't remember the date um, that I saw uh, for them, but that's right between 1899 and 1902 in terms of the Baltimore Orioles. And then on the left side of the screen, that is actually the, 1903 New York Highlanders. So they uh, they made the big move out there to New York, and uh, as you as you can uh, probably see here, it was a pretty successful move. So today, uh, as previously mentioned, we will be covering the Chavez Ravine. Um, going over some of the notes that I, I took down uh, for this, it was uh, not good. Um, a, a lot of baseball fans don't realize what actually happened. Uh, so we'll just kind of jump right into it with what we were told. Um, this is this is how baseball fans learn about the creation of Dodger Stadium, uh, where it came from, how it came to be. So in 1958, uh, the city of Los Angeles agreed to exchange 352 acres of land in Chavez Ravine to the Dodgers in exchange for the team to build a 50,000 seat stadium. Construction on the privately financed stadium began on September 17th of 1959. While the Dodger Stadium was under construction, the Dodgers actually played at the LA Coliseum. And uh, at the LA Coliseum, you know, <clears throat> you, you can have fans, you can have uh, attendances of uh, nearly 100,000, sometimes over 100,000, uh, which is un unforeseen um, in baseball history to this point. Um, I mean, even till even to today, these are the, the largest crowds to ever watch a baseball game. So Dodger Stadium was originally set to open in 1961, but some landslides and lawsuits delayed construction by a year. So on April 10th, 1962, the Los Angeles Dodgers played their very first game at Dodger Stadium against the Cincinnati Reds with over 52,000 fans packed into the five level structure. Not only was Dodger Stadium home to the Dodgers during their inaugural season, but it was also home to the Los Angeles Angels, who played there for three seasons before moving to Anaheim in 1966. So essentially, this is what we were told. This is how we're told uh, the Dodger Stadium came to be. This is kind of how we were told um, everything kind of happened. Uh, and, and most people just kind of went with it. I went with it for a long time. Um, and it wasn't until recently that I realized kind of the, the darker side of things. Um, and with that, we'll get into the real backstory behind Chavez Ravine. So the real backstory, Chavez Ravine was actually named after Julian Chavez. He was a rancher who served as assistant mayor, a city councilman, and eventually one of LA County's first supervisors. Um, in, 18, in 1844, he started buying up land in what was now in what was then known as uh, Stone Quarry Hills, uh, an area with several separate ravines. Uh, Chavez died of a heart attack in 1879 at the age of 69. Uh, by the early 1900s, however, semi-rural communities had sprung up um, all throughout the steep terrain, uh, as you can see here in the bottom right picture, um, mostly on the ridges between the neighboring sulfur and cemetery ravines, uh, what eventually became 
known as Chavez Ravine, encompassed about 315 acres and had three main neighborhoods. That would be uh, Palo Verde, La Loma, and Bishop. I apologize if I butchered any of those names. I don't think I did. Um, it had a grocery store, a church, and an elementary school. So this was a, this was a functioning town. You know, um, many residents grew their own food and uh, raised animals such as pigs, goats, and turkeys. Uh, many Mexican-American families at this point in time, unfortunately redlined and prevented from moving into other neighborhoods, um, established themselves in Chavez Ravine. Uh, residents of the tight-knit community often left their doors unlocked, which is something you know, positively unheard of um, in today's world. So not only was this a relatively safe community, it was a relatively tight-knit community. They had, you know, it was a full functioning town um, with multiple different uh, neighborhoods in it. Um, so Chavez Ravine, like I said, was, was pretty much working well on its own. And here you can see one of the, one of the nice families who uh, lived in Chavez Ravine um, in the 40s. Looking at uh, how the battle for Chavez Ravine kind of began uh, by the early 1950s, uh, outsiders often saw the neighborhood as a slum. City officials uh, decided that Chavez Ravine was ripe for redevelopment, uh, and that kicked off a decade-long battle over the land. Uh, the city began trying to convince Chavez Ravine homeowners to sell. Uh, despite intense pressure, many residents resisted. Uh, developers offered immediate cash payments, uh, to residents for their property. They offered uh, remaining homeowners less money after each sale. So residents feared that if they held out, they would not get a fair price. So basically what they did was, you know, for every, every time a family sold their property to uh, the, these developers, um, they would offer less money to the next person. So, you know, it was always, it was always trying to, you know, they were trying to screw these people over essentially they were trying to convince them hey you know if you don't take this offer uh this family over here is going to take the exact same offer and i'm going to come over here and offer you half the money after i after i you know seal the deal with them so very shady very shady private practices um something that you know just is just downright awful um in other cases, officials would use the power of the eminent domain to acquire plots of land and force residents out of their home. Uh, when they did, they typically lowballed homeowners, offering them far less money than their land was worth. So not only were they being offered less money than the previous people that sold uh, their land to these developers, but they were already being offered far less than their, their land was actually worth. So it's a lose, 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 lose situation for these homeowners. And all they're looking to do is just make a living and, you know, just live out in a peaceful neighborhood in Chavez Ravine. So by this point, by the late forties, early fifties, we see the rise of the Elysian Park Heights project. Um, and so the city of Los Angeles labeled the ravine blighted and officials produced a plan for a massive public housing project. Now, this was thanks to the newfound federal funding from the National Housing Act of 1949. Uh, basically, what the National Housing Act of 1949 did was provide all this federal funding to these cities in order to create this uh, low-income housing, essentially, public housing um, for families that, you know, couldn't afford to have their own, um, you know, their own house, their own car, and stuff like that. These were uh, small areas that they could put a whole bunch of people in and you know stack some stores here and there and just kind of call it a day um so as i mentioned um the new public housing area was agreed upon for the ravine um, and it was known as elysian park heights and it was actually designed by architects robert e alexander and the Aust in an austrian uh, architecture or architect uh, richard neutra i hope i didn't butcher that name either um, they founded, uh, it, was, it was actually funded in part by federal money. So it wasn't the whole thing wasn't funded by federal money, but most of it was. Um, the project was supposed to include 24 13 story buildings, uh, which you can actually see here in the distance. These are the 13 story apartment houses, um, as well as 163 low rises, uh, providing nearly 3,600 new low cost apartments and fitted with several schools and playgrounds. And I believe these these garden type homes that they have uh, listed here, I believe those are the, uh, the low rises, the townhouses, I guess they're called nowadays. Um, that was kind of what uh, they were looking to do um, with this area. And this is, like I said, this is the exact same area that they ended up building Dodger Stadium on. Um, 
So Chavez Ravine residents were told uh, that those who were displaced actually could return to live in these housing projects. Um, I, I'd hate to see the deal they would have tried to give them uh, in that case. So, um, but in 1953, uh, this would prove to, to never come to pass. Uh, Norris Paulson, a political conservative, uh, he was actually elected mayor of Los Angeles on the platform that included opposition to construction of all new public housing projects. In addition, uh, a public referendum was then passed barring all public housing in Los Angeles. Paulson's election and referendum resulted in the termination of the Elysian Park Heights development. So basically, um, I, I couldn't find any evidence to, to suggest why they didn't want to, um, but apparently a lot of the people in the city of Los Angeles didn't like the idea of all this public housing. Um, and, you know, between, between Paulson's uh, kind of his, his platform that he ran on um, to be elected mayor and a couple referendums that were passed, um, it, it looks like this project was was axed before it even got started. They never even they never even began any real type of construction for this. Uh, moving forward, this is what I like to call the Dodgers come a knocking. So Walter O'Malley, uh, who who became uh, the full the full Dodgers owner uh, in 1950, he would actually orchestrate the deal that eventually led to the construction of Dodger Stadium. Uh, between 1959 and 1962. So at this time, they were still the Brooklyn Dodgers and Ebbets Field was their home. Uh, this was very quickly becoming outdated. At first, uh, Mr. O'Malley desired a new state-of-the-art stadium in Brooklyn. He wanted to stay in New York. He wanted to stay in Brooklyn. He wanted a new, brand new stadium, all the, all the good stuff. Um, but due to political strife and local officials, O'Malley's plans were rejected. So O'Malley ultimately turned his sights west after it was clear that uh, he was not going to be obtaining what he wanted in New York. Uh, he decided to move the Dodgers to Los Angeles in 1958, almost a decade from the start of the displacement of the Chavez Ravine residents. Um, not only was O'Malley successful in moving the Dodgers to Los Angeles, he was also instrumental in moving the Giants to San Francisco. Uh, I don't know if that was kind of a... Uh, get, you know, kind of get back at, at New York City um, for not, you know, not giving him his stadium that he really wanted. Um, that's kind of where I took it. So for years at this point, um, the nearly vacant Chavez Ravine uh, had lay unused, but for a tiny number of uh, remaining original residents, and the land was offered by the city to various potential developers without success. And this was, you know, over the course of that decade. Um, eventually, the city proposed to O'Malley that an entirely separate plot of land, a plot not part of or close to Chavez Ravine, be used as the site of his stadium. But O'Malley declined this offer and expressed interest in Chavez Ravine, which he had seen from the air. Now, here is a picture um, of kind of the, the edge of the Chavez Ravine. Uh, and this is kind of the this might have been, you know, one of the angles potentially that he saw um, while he was flying overhead. And, you know, I, I don't. I mean, it was without, I'd have to see it from further back to see if it was actually, you know, as uh, intriguing as what uh, Mr. O'Malley thought, but it's definitely worth, worth noticing here. Um, so at this point, the deal is done in September of 1957, prior to O'Malley's decision to move West, uh, the territory of Chavez Ravine was still reserved for public purposes on these grounds. Uh, the proposal that Chavez were being used for a baseball stadium received considerable backlash. Uh, a lot of the people just, they didn't really feel like uh, uh, a major league, major league, you know, professional baseball team was a public use required by the constitution uh, as a limit on the use of uh, eminent domain. Uh, so some Los Angeles officials argued that the area should be used to establish a zoo, um, citing that the zoo would provide public recreation to the city uh, later that year, however, uh, the Los Angeles City Council approved the transfer of the land to the Dodgers. This process was actually halted uh, by a successful petition that uh, established the need for a public vote to decide whether the Dodgers could legally obtain the land. The vote, uh, the vote to stop the land transfer held in June of 1958 uh, actually tallied around 677,000 votes for that time. That was probably a very large number for the city of Los Angeles. Um, it failed by about 25,000 votes. 
And so uh, the city ended up handing Chavez Ravine to the Dodgers for a relatively small consideration. Dodger Stadium was then constructed with private funds and remains privately owned to this day. And here you can see this is probably reminiscent of uh, when uh, Stephen actually used this picture um, for his history talk a few weeks ago, I think at this point. Um, you can actually see where it says Elysian Park Ave. That was going to be the main road going into um, the Elysian Park uh, Heights project. Uh, I mean, if you can look at this, this was, this was already after all of the all of the people had already been moved out. The land was all flattened around and cleared. Um, and Dodger Stadium, it looks like at this point, it's almost almost probably a quarter, maybe halfway done. So by this point in time. Um, it was made very clear to the people who lived in the Chavez Ravine area that uh, the time time was nigh, time was running out for them. Um, there was significant resistance to the eviction by many residents, um, but by May of 1959, nearly 10 years after the struggle uh, began, Manuel and Avrana Arquiega, uh, with her daughter Aurora Vargas, were among the last of the tiny number of residents uh, to hold out against the government land acquisition effort undertaken for the original public housing project. So by the time the Dodgers even, you know, decided the Chavez Ravine was where they wanted to go, um, it, there were only a, a few people left, you know, five, six, seven people left in this area, um, just holding on for dear life, uh, holding on to their, their livelihood and their homes, essentially. Um, they were they were forced to move. Uh, they were actually forced removal uh, by the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department on May 9th of 1959. Um, Vargas, 36, at, at the time she was 36, um, she was carried kicking and screaming from her home at 1771 Malvina Avenue by four deputies. And you can see her being drug out of her home, out of her home um, up here in your top right picture. Um, I'll move me out of the way there. So that's her being carried, kicking and screaming out of her home. Um, this is actually, these are all pictures of the uh, Arcaga. Ar Arcaga, I'm gonna hope I'm saying Arcaga right. Um, these are all pictures of the Arcaga family. Um, all of these, um, you know, unfortunate events. Um, uh, so for her, uh, minutes later, after she was carried out of her home, it was bulldozed. It was completely torn apart. Um, and that you can see there in the picture right below the one of her being drug out of her home. Uh, her actions resulted in her arrest. Vargas was fined and briefly sent to jail for her resistance. Uh, Cruz eventually knocked down the ridge separating the sulfur and cemetery ravines that filled them in, burying Palo Verde, uh, Palo Verde Elementary School in the process. Uh, Manuel Arcega was the final holdout. Uh, he was living in a tent on the site of his demolished home for months. Public sympathy for the Arcagas quickly waned, however, uh, when subsequent news and news reports indicated that the Arcagas actually owned 12 rental houses somewhere in Los Angeles. This was, however, a false representation. It was cousins, relatives, children who owned these houses. Um, Arcaga eventually relented and accepted the city's offer of $10,500, but the California Court of Appeal uh, actually denied them interest on their award to which they were entitled under the Constitution. Uh, sheriff's deputies kicked down the door of the Arcaga's family home. Uh, movers hauled out the family's furniture and the residents were forcibly escorted out. Now you look at some of these pictures. I mean, and it, it looks like a war. It looks like a war scene. You know, I mean, this was this was to put a baseball stadium um, and a public housing uh, area in. Um, they, you know, came in and uh, now, as you can see there in the bottom, the far bottom left picture, um, that is actually a, I'm assuming a notice from the Department of Health, the city of Los Angeles, um, dated to May 11th of 1959, uh, dated to Mr. and Mrs. Arcaga and children uh, at the address of 1801 Malvina Avenue, um, pretty much saying comply with the following discontinue the use and occupancy of tents or for living and sleeping purposes. That's it. They're basically telling them, look, you can't stay here. You can't be here. Um, and um, unfortunately for, for the Arcaga family, they were absolutely screwed over. They were forcibly removed. They were, uh, you know, taken apart piece by piece. Um, this whole area was a, a nice, peaceful community. 
Um, and, you know, unfortunately, a baseball stadium became uh, more important for them. Um, so, obviously, uh, you see some pictures here of uh, when the stadium was built. Um, the first game, uh, they had a whole bunch of balloons, and that's Mr. O'Malley there at the bottom right. Um, and I have to ask the question, is this a stadium with blood on its hands? Uh, the truth is a, a large a large majority uh, of fans don't even realize the dark history surrounding Dodger Stadium. And now that you do, is your view of it different? Feel free to let us know uh, your thoughts on the topic in the comments below or on any of our social media pages. Um, you can even contact Stephen or I personally if you feel like you need to talk about this. Um, basically... Now, I was hoping you know, this would be a longer episode. I was hoping I could have Steven. Uh, we would go back and forth um, uh, you know, on, on different topics about this, but uh, I'll just try to give you my thoughts on it. Um, baseball never, become, never comes before uh, you know, people's houses, people's homes, uh, people's neighborhoods. You know, it definitely doesn't come before that. And unfortunately, during you know, the 40s and 50s, uh, the United States and, and the world in general was a very segregated place. Um, you know, to be Mexican American in the United States in the 40s and 50s uh, wasn't, didn't really get you very far. Um, so unfortunately for these families, um, they were kind of taken advantage of. And, you know, it's, it's hard to put into words uh, because, you know, this was, as, as mentioned at the beginning of this episode, um, a very dark history, uh, very, very dark um and, you know, as, as I like to put it, it's a stadium with blood on its hands uh, because, you know, there were uh, hundreds of uh, hundreds of people who were forcibly removed. You know, they were they were sold uh, you know, bad deals on their on their homes. Uh, they were offered far less money than the land was owned um, than the land was worth. They were offered far less money than what it was worth. Um, and, you know, seemingly every time someone eventually sold out to these, uh, these banks and these uh, developers and these city officials, they would just go ahead and offer less money to the next person to try to convince everybody to sell quickly uh, so they could, you know, slap their, their public housing project or their zoo or their baseball stadium in here. Um, it seems like, it seems like, you know, the city of Los Angeles uh, was pretty much going to do whatever they wanted to with this area, whether or not the, the people had any say in it. Um, as you can see, you know, they, they got close to declining or to, to denying the, uh, the Dodgers, the Chavez Ravine area. But, you know, out of 677,000 votes, they failed by 25,000. Um, so, like I said, uh, it's unfortunate, but it is what it is. Um, it, it was a bad, bad situation. Uh, but the, the people who the people who committed it, you know, they'll they'll always remember what they did, um, and, and the people who uh, suffered from it. I hope you know eventually found a new home, eventually found a new life, and uh, were able to move on with it relatively um, quickly. So, with that said, um, you can always find us on our social media sites. I appreciate you guys watching this uh, relatively short episode. Um, you can always find us on Instagram at Real Dugout Talk. Uh, you can find us on TikTok at Dugout Talk. You can find us on Twitter at Dugout Talk One. You can always find us here on YouTube at Dugout Talk. You can also find us on Facebook at Real Dugout Talk. I uh, appreciate you guys watching today. Um, I real quick, I want to go into uh, kind of our. Um, let me go ahead and stop the sharing. There we go. Okay, I wanted I wanted to uh, to jump into how the baseball's coming, uh, how the baseball game is coming. I should say, uh, for those of you who don't know, um, I've been recording MLB The Show twenty. Uh, we've been we've been rebuilding the Orioles the past couple of days. Um, I've I've got plenty of episodes pre recorded for the future, um, so I want to let you guys know to be on the alert for those. Those will be coming out, I think, pretty much daily. I I've thought about, since I have so, I'm so far ahead, I thought about doubling them up and doing two a day. Um, not sure whether or not I'm going to do that yet. I think we're probably just going to stick to one every day. I don't want to overload you guys. That's like, that'd be like two hours of, uh, of me just sitting in like MLB the show, uh, just, you know, goofing around, uh, rebuilding the Orioles. So 
Yeah, I look forward to plenty of that. Uh, I'd love to get your guys' feedback um, as to as to you know what I should do uh, in, in MLB the show. If you guys want to see out of the park baseball, if you don't know what out of the park baseball is, it's basically just MLB the show, but it's far more in depth. Um, the gameplay is not really there. Really isn't gameplay. Uh, you're pretty much just a manager when you actually see the games played. Um, but the the front office aspect of this game is far and beyond uh, anything that MLB The Show has or probably will ever achieve. Every single minor league team, there's independent leagues, there's uh, foreign leagues, um, there's, you know, uh, free agency is, is crazy. Um, you've got um, international free agents. So, you know, uh, prominent Japanese and Korean and Australian players will come over and you can sign them. Um, and, and you could, you could uh, expand the team to any, you can expand the league to any amount of teams. You can create your own custom league. Uh, so there's a whole, whole bunch of stuff. The, the opportunities are endless uh, with out of the park baseball and out of the park baseball 22 is coming out here in the next couple of weeks. Uh, if you guys really do want to see me uh, create some content for that, I'll go ahead and buy it. Uh, just to just to get you guys some some good content um, with that said I hope you guys have uh, have had a, a good Friday I hope you're ready for the weekend um, I ex- look forward to seeing you guys on Monday we have a good episode planned for you guys on Monday hopefully hopefully it's a little bit longer than this one um, we're running at like half an hour here almost um, so with that said I appreciate you guys watching um, if you have any, any suggestions, like I said, leave it for it down, uh, leave it for us down in the comments. Um, you know, I appreciate you guys watching every episode that we post, uh, the, the support we've been getting is, is crazy. Awesome. Uh, especially on, uh, Facebook and on Instagram. Um, I, I can't thank you guys enough with that said, I'm Cameron, and I can't wait to see you guys in the next episode on Monday. Have a great weekend.